an undeniable climate emergency podcast. Today on Amplifier, we talk to Dr. Fernando Tormes Aponte, Assistant Professor of Sociology of the University of Pittsburgh, about the value of human life in the face of climate crisis, the politics of research, the importance of solidarity and mutual aid, and how those struggles can support efforts for movements to gain broader political influence in Puerto Rico and beyond. He works to dispel the lies of big corporations and governments to demonstrate how prioritizing relief to the most vulnerable is the most effective strategy for any society. We hope you can find solidarity in his message. It truly inspired us and gave us a lot to think about. Fernando, welcome to Amplifier, or should I say welcome back, as we tried very hard to have a conversation that I was incredibly excited about last week, and connectivity problems kept stymieing us. So I am thrilled that you were able to rejoin us and pick up the conversation. That's my pleasure. Um, So where we were at, we were just starting to talk about um, the, some of the efforts around mutual aid in Puerto Rico in response in particular to some of the um, um, uh, Fiona and other uh, natural disasters and kind of how that developed. So let's, although we might be going over some ground we did before, I think let's just start that conversation from scratch. So uh, cool. without interruption by the internet and, and see where we're going. So we'd just love to hear, you know, maybe just kind of talk a little bit about how some of the mutual aid um, organizations have evolved in response to Fiona. I mean, I think Fiona was one of the big triggers, but I think there's a long tradition that it's based in, but um, love to hear you just kind of uh, give us an overview of that, and then we can dive into some of the meat on it. Great, great. Well, I think one of the things that motivated us to talk about this was just thinking about how even when we think that movements may have failed at a particular point in time, they may nevertheless leave uh, lessons for future struggles, experiences, and insights that people can bring uh, to subsequent efforts. And I think that's exactly what we saw with respect to uh, mutual aid in Puerto Rico, particularly um, emerging prior to Hurricane Maria, but becoming extremely important in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria. So one of the big uh, contributors to organizing this mutual aid network was the fact that there were folks that had been active in efforts to kick out the U.S. uh, military from the island municipality of Vieques to the east coast of the big island of Puerto Rico. So you had folks that had really gotten a lot of experience with organizing, then realizing that there was a need to organize mutual aid in Puerto Rico. And what's fascinating is that this predates Hurricane Maria because folks had already an analysis of the global juncture that they found themselves in, as well as the local uh, juncture, and they they already expected that there were going to be needs around food, water, energy, and they began to organize uh, s- small nodes of, of what became a broader network of mutual aid, and they started working with various communities in different parts of the Puerto Rican archipelago, and th- these networks, uh, of course, had a huge impact in the aftermath in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, where local and subnational, territorial, and uh, national neglect uh, made people really looking out for themselves so necessary and urgent for preserving life, as well as uh, the provision of life preserving resources like food, water, and 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 energy. So we see that this this mutual aid network pops up. It it manages to strengthen itself and become really well organized. And of course, we we witness international solidarity at the time, so much so that some folks didn't even know how to handle the amount of aid that was coming in. Some people, international allies and partners and folks in the U.S. and the continental U.S. were, were, some became even offended, like, Oh, I'm offering all this aid, and and it wasn't that people didn't want it. It was that the, the sheer amount was hard to uh, to manage. So, and of course, there was an interesting debate that emerged at that time 
um, and I, I think it's 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 really important to to listen to what activists are debating because they were the ones who had the analysis that inform efforts to build this network, but they also debated themselves, right? So one one person, um, Angel Perez, specifically a social worker in Puerto Rico, longtime student activist, had argued. Well, you know, if we put all of our energies in mutual aid, we may be giving the government a pass on the responsibility to its people. And uh, Giovanni Roberto, a fellow student organizer, um, this is a friendly debate. They all knew each other who had been very much involved in building up a mutual aid network in Puerto Rico, uh, published a a wonderful piece uh, that he titled... Sin pedir perdón y sin pedir permiso, which translates to uh, without saying sorry and without asking for permission, uh, <laughs> where he says, look, uh, holding a government accountable and providing mutual aid are not mutually exclusive efforts. In fact, in our times, we need both uh, because even though we cannot lose sight of making government responsible for providing the resources that they extract from communities, um, there are immediate urgent needs that we just can't ignore in the process of organizing. So I think that w- that became a really important um, contribution at the time from someone who's immersed in both thinking but also doing that I think provided a a lot of that informed organizing moving forward where folks acknowledge that there needed to be a tactical diversity and, and, and you, we witness others that embrace that tactical diversity. For instance, the black feminist collective, La Colectiva Feminista Construcción also has this internal debate, decides that they're going to do some mutual aid early in, in, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, all the while making broader claims uh, with with the local, uh, the Puerto Rican territorial government, uh, but then saying, okay, we've done our mutual aid work as of right now. They occupied a house that wasn't in, in, that wasn't being used in Rio Piedras in San Juan, uh, but they decided that they were going to go back to their political work of building popular struggle and having different groups being able to do that. I think created the foundations for what later became the 2019 uh, uprising that led to uh, the removal of the governor, someone, something that was quite, quite uh, unprecedented in Puerto Rican politics and that was inspiring to folks well beyond Puerto Rico. Uh, this is happening at the same time as Chile is going through a major protest wave, right? Uh, shortly thereafter, there's a protest wave in the Dominican Republic uh, there's a, a teacher strike wave in the United States. So it, it, it becomes really a, an interesting juncture globally of folks uh, mobilizing. So and I, and I think it's important to recognize that oftentimes we want to think about the big macro level type of mobilization. Um, and we forget the sort of micro processes of building uh, those those. Uh, capacities to engage in popular mobilization. Yeah, and I think that this is one thing I had said when we were talking with, uh, initially is I genuinely think that the work you're engaged in and understanding this linkage is some of the most important work being done on the planet. How we understand this connection between very rooted local mutual aid and resilience networks and larger p- political transformation. And I I firmly, truly believe that our survival as a species in many ways is linked to our ability to bring these two things together. Um, And I think that that's, you know, so there's a number of things that, I mean, what I love is, and this is where real debate and real politics to me always happens is in organizing and in struggle and this kind of fruitful conversation, which as we all know, sometimes can get heated inside a movement, but that's, that's part of it, this fruitful conversation of building both these things in tandem. And it is what, one of the things I want to pull from that is that it's a very interesting 
point that you make, which is sometimes that's going to be within an organization, but also we're talking about an ecosystem of organizations that can be playing different roles in concert with each other. And I think that's really critical. That's a really critical point, which is that it's not about there being a single right path, right? Mm -hmm. It's about this, just like we're talking about resilient networks, that includes resilient organizations of different kinds, some that may be up fast and gone soon, and that's the nature of it. We see that with a lot of direct action organizations, other that are rooted in communities for generations, right? Um, exactly. So I don't know if you want to talk some about that, how you've seen, how you've seen this ecosystem kind of in, within Puerto Rico evolving out of, out of these, these, these struggles in this process. And, and are they building an ecosystem and working, able to work together? Um, and, and, and what are some of the, you think, the results of that, that, that have been? Yeah, I mean, one of the ways in which we can observe indicators of broader coordination and the impacts of that coordination among different groups is that people have really started to reject the traditional majority parties in Puerto Rico. These parties are now struggling to preserve their majority status, which has huge implications with respect to policymaking. Mm -hmm. And this for a long time was really hard to achieve. These parties were able to convince the vast majority of folks in Puerto Rico that they should, de that people should deposit their hopes in their leaders and that it was all about them bringing in new faces uh, and new ideas or, or somehow they were going to finally solve all of the problems uh, as opposed to finding uh, third party alternatives. So in the electoral realm, we've witnessed, particularly in 2020, the strong emergence of third party opposition um, groups and if you were to add the amount of votes that they had at the gubernatorial level, uh, they were contenders for mm. winning yeah. the gubernatorial seat. This, mind you, this is a year after ousting the governor. So we're talking about huge shifts in the power that people had through electoral and non-electoral forms of mobilization. So, that is only possible when a number of things have happened. Some have to do with ideas are, are changing. The ways, the, pers people, the perspectives that people hold are changing. Folks started to develop an analysis of these majority parties as actually being more similar to each other than they are to the alternative. And it, it, it motivated the rejection of these as electoral alternatives. So there's, there's discursive roots of social change. We see that. But there's also organizational roots. There, there are people, these mutual aid networks, they become politicized. They become politicized in 2019. The very networks have been formed not just locally, but also solidarity networks internationally, they become politicized when it comes to uh, non-electoral mobilization in 2019. And then we see that these, these groups that I think to the surprise of some, and if not most, had a pretty good showing in 2020, they are now talking about joining forces. In spite of the, the current laws, that essentially would make it so the one of the two parties, the leftist parties, would have to uh, pretty much sacrifice their party um, in favor of supporting one alternative. Um, so it's, it's a huge sacrifice, uh, but they're working with it, the current law in order to be able to change it moving forward. So 
you know, what we're in summer, I think what we're witnessing here is the value and importance of moving away from the groups that we tend to organize with and beginning to see the importance of popular mobilization, mobilizing groups that we usually t just take for granted or assume that they, they won't be interested and not just doing the work of of changing people's minds and really engaging in discursive struggles, which are of course extremely important, they've mattered, but also really organizing locally to mobilize folks. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think it, it, in so many ways, Puerto Rico like it is through, not through choice, but through circumstance is, can play such a leading role on a number of fronts. So we know that like so many countries dealing with not just the history, but the ongoing process of colonization, um, least responsible for the global ecological crisis and collapse that we're witnessing, um, but most vulnerable on the front mm -hmm. lines, in, the, in, in, in the, the, the front lines of being vulnerable to extreme storms and rising sea levels and all of these things compounded by the legacy and ongoing colonization that leaves people vulnerable and without the resources and the continuing extraction, you know, Luma is the perfect example of, you know, the, the, the privatized power that is, was clearly through graft and grift and incompetence, just extracting while leaving people vulnerable to these things. So you've got that on the one hand, um, but then this kind of resilient networks and struggle from below, because I also think even in, in, in the mainland in the US, you know, where our third party history tends to be people, you know, and have been involved in some of these efforts in ways that I can be quite critical of myself, people trying to create a party and drop it into the world. When you look at what you're describing, it's, it's, political alternatives coming actually out of that kind of organizing and, and the, the process of, of democracy through action rather than a leader being claimed for the future on top of and dropped into the movement. So I think both of these areas are just like extremely fascinating. And I think it's, you know, part of the legacy of colonizations also is I think a dismissal and an ignoring of the kind of leading role that a place like Puerto Rico can play and how much the rest of the left in the United States has to learn because this is the future negative and positive that we're facing. Um, and I, I, yeah. I mean, I'd I love to hear from you just how, how is it that we can start to, cause I, I mean, bring these lessons in and rather than it seeing being it also ran, I really, I mean, we talked about this some last week, even though we interrupted off and on is that when we look at, you know, the leading role globally around um, uh, climate change and fossil fuels, which is that, native and indigenous protest movements have been the most effective. It's the same way. I feel like the whole movement, just like the whole world needs to be flipped on its head mm. about who is actually leading, who is actually doing the stuff that works, who is finding the most effective ways of doing things. And it's not the movement as we've understood it. It's mm -hmm. not the political structure as we've understood it. So I, I mean, I'm just, you know, and that's what that, obviously this conversation for me is trying to suck up some of this knowledge. How do we yeah. how do we get that role where, where where the left in the U.S. and the climate movement in the U.S. and globally can start learning from and taking leadership from these kinds of struggles and these kinds sorts of organizations? I think some of the best lessons uh, we can take involve Puerto Ricans, um, but it wasn't ex exclusively about Puerto Ricans. Is uh, the environmental justice movement? in the United States. Um, if you think about, for instance, how this movement emerges, it's a lot out of repression of what at the time was the American Indian movement. Uh, they go international, and they, but they keep organizing locally. Uh, we see Robert Bullard's study on toxic waste uh, uh, facility siting. Um, in, in the phenomenon of environmental racism, uh, we see folks realizing that uh, they were essentially already exposed to environmental hazards and uh, what we now recognize as linked to 
uh, climate change and broader environmental justice problems, they, they start coordinating and they, they draft the principles of environmental justice and, they, and, and as importantly, which I don't think it, it, it gets talked about enough, they draft the Hamas principles of inclusive and democratic organizing. I mean, this is a blueprint for democratic and inclusive organizing anywhere. And, and, and of course, people have to read documents like these and think, OK, how, do, how does this apply to our struggle? Right. Because I recall sharing it with colleagues in Puerto Rico and there are some big words in there that people are like, I don't know if, we, if that speaks to us, um, you know, so. But there are things that do. There are things like supporting the leadership of those who are most exposed to the burdens of histories of environmental uh, racism and supporting those who are at the front lines of climate change. Those are things that are applicable well beyond uh, environmental uh, activist efforts. So, and what's fascinating too is that not only did they do, do minority groups and minoritized groups in the United States uh, manage to get together, draft these principles, they start building slowly an infrastructure that allows to, that, that supports their organizing over time, locally, but also internationally. And they start maintaining a presence in major global negotiations, as well as in areas where the global justice movement was, was organizing itself. Uh, Cochabamba, the World Social Forum, they are continuing to develop ties and linking struggles, seeing where there are uh, experiencing system, uh, uh, symptoms of similar systems. So, I think that's 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 where we can draw a lot of lessons and, and, and think, for instance, about how what did they do once they organized? Well, they said the, the vast majority of money that goes into environmental activism is not coming to us, even though we're the ones who are experiencing these issues. It's going to these professionalized uh, grass tops, national level, ma majority white led and dominated organizations that were not looking back into the communities that were experiencing some of these issues. So they called them out. And at first, not a lot replied, but later more and more did. And of course, uh, after 2020, I think it, it, for a lot of folks, it became untenable to ignore uh, the claims of these groups. So we see that major green groups have started to reallocate resources to grassroots groups. And this isn't just in the U.S. We see it in the U.S. with the Building Equity for Alignment Fund uh, that's transferring money from major green groups to grassroots climate justice groups, and environmental justice groups, mostly minority led. But we're also seeing it internationally with Climate Action Network. They also have a mechanism for redistributing resources from the global north to groups in the global south. I think this is why we're seeing a lot of power right now among um, environment in, within the environmental movement, locally, nationally, and internationally. I mean, we're seeing major pieces of legislation, of course, some of which includes things that the environmental justice groups are saying we don't agree with, but it also has. Uh, a, a lot of great things that they've been demanding for a long time. They've had, the Climate Justice Alliance published a fantastic policy analysis of, of recent bills like Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, and and they say what's good and what's bad. And when you when you read it, you realize actually there's some major wins here uh, to build from. So. I think that's where we can find really important lessons uh, within environmental organizing and, and well beyond. It's interesting because having talked to a lot of them, um, uh, you know, for the podcast, a number of climate scientists from different areas in the global south, one of the themes that really came through, and I think there's a strong parallel here, which is that climate and, in fact, all science, but climate science is what we were focusing on in environmental science, 
has been severely undermined because of the fact that it doesn't get done funded and carried out locally. Mm-hmm. So you tend to have major global academic institutions, you know, Ivy Leagues or whatnot, people literally flying into an area to to do research and then flying out and the research is then carried out and implemented somewhere else where it's put into policy papers. And, you know, there's so many layers to what happens there, which is, first of all, that the local scientists are local and there's generational knowledge. They actually understand on some fundamental level being from there, having generational roots there, whether they're indigenous or not. It really, you know, there's complexities in any particular locale, but they understand, they have relationships, they have an understanding, and that their institutions themselves are often part of, you know, they, they may be part of the state if they're in a state funded, and actually have access and an ability to bridge communication with, with uh, you know, local state actors as well in a way that doesn't. And so what that means is the data coming in itself is flawed horribly flawed and and huge gaps exist and the people are coming in and getting bad data feeding bad data into models that aren't built around that and so it's it's really to me there's a really fascinating parallel which is this is also true around the movement building you know mm-hmm. that the, the, the movements are getting bad data right mm-hmm. when you are organizing from outside and above and the leadership isn't local your political and scientific understanding is flawed your policy recommendations your means to action and i think that this is you know if we're going to get through this figuring out both on the 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 raw science level but also on the political organizing and increasingly i think an interconnection between the two how that actual funding goes to people doing work on the ground absolutely and, and how that fundamentally transforms what movements look like and their efficacy right we're talking about efficacy. We're talking about what every movement and every nonprofit and NGO is supposed to be as a bottom line is what works, what mm-hmm. actually has impact. And that's, I think, what we're finding on the science and the organizing is get money to the local people organizing locally. They know what the issues are. They know who the other players are. They know how to build networks. And then you show up. How can I be of service, right? Exactly. There is internet, international solidarity is critical, but how, how are you showing up with that solidarity? Early, early, right? So a lot, what tends to happen is that, uh, you know, well-intended folks show up at the end of the process of the research and say, hey, here's what I found. Well, in some cases that, that works, right? And it may, it may serve certain purposes, but what we are trying to incentivize right now and to support is really to go into communities at the earliest stage possible to 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 co-design and to even the process of deciding what are the most pressing questions according to the community or communities that you're working with and then building from that okay so we decide on on pressing questions i was having a wonderful conversation with a long-time environmental justice activist elizabeth jampierre and one of the things that she shared with me was, you know, because there's been this history of academics going into communities, extracting knowledge, never really, and building their wonderful careers, uh, <laughs> and never really looking back and, and reallocating the benefits of, that they've extracted from that engagement with communities, it's created certain uh, animosities within communities towards uh, academics. So some folks assume that because there is that kind of bad energy that we shouldn't just, we, we should just forget about it. And this happens among activists. Activists, they're like, you guys are messed up. I don't want to work with you. And it happens amongst academics where I was like, I'm not really going to be able to ever get entry into that community. So what I hear from activists that I've been in conversation with, some, of course, not all, is that, look, It's not that we don't want to engage with academics. We often need to be able to provide evidence in our struggles. And there's so many examples where evidence can be really impactful and really important. But two things. First is 
we want to be involved early into this process. And second, we don't want to be tokens in your budget, which is usually the case, right? Right. It's like, what, $15, $20. I was, I was speaking with an, a, a, a colleague of mine and, and we were looking at this huge survey that was done with minorities in the United States. And it's pages long, like this must have taken more than 60 minutes to fill out. And they were given $15, like for a very lengthy survey. So, you know, this is a prime example of communities being tokens in our budgets. So this requires really uh, rethinking. How are we going to design research? How are granting agencies and foundations going to go about grant making and really rethinking how we design not just the research, but also the distribution of research resource, uh, resources. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, I think that it's because obviously if you are doing academic work, there is a level of independence that is important in terms of the data sets that you're doing. And I think that, that to me, there's a real revelation here that following the leadership of local organizers doesn't need to mean giving up that level of independence when it comes to findings and 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 the independence of the data and and how you're presenting that it doesn't mean subsuming that and 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 releasing a level of academic integrity um again to me what it actually means is that you're increasing the level of integrity because you're increasing the data inputs by having these rooted things you're increasing the impacts by by bringing this in so it's actually to me should be a baseline of academic standard if you were going to be engaging in in local struggles to be taking that level of leadership to be learning and listening and then understanding and i think that there's a that level of being of you know i it's it's something that we're trying to do around uh, around undeniable in our the whole we're, we're doing is can we show up and we don't have many resources to show up with yet but we're working on it how can we be of service right and mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a much more, I think there's a much more powerful, that's a much more powerful place to be in than people understand, particularly mm -hmm. if you have any interest in challenging dominant economic, social, racial, colonial structures. That idea, if you were coming in from a position of privilege, that being of service is actually a very powerful place to be. If Absolutely. the power isn't about your power. Exactly. The power is about the power for transformation, right? Mm -hmm. That's, it's a powerful, it's a powerful and very gratifying place to be, frankly. I mean, I think you, you build much better relationships, right? You build Absolutely. much better, you know, you mailed a bunch of long, that's, that's that kind of solidarity of being served. So I think that's something that, that the movement, and it is, didn't just happen, happened because of those struggles, successful and failed. Although again, I think of it, this whole idea that there's no really such thing as a failed struggle. You know, those are, are steps along the way. We can see it starting. We can see it starting to change. Um, yeah. So I think that that's that's something, you know, that we're hoping to be able to raise that voice in the movement on the scientific side and on this side as well, because um, I just think it's so critical. Yeah. And I think there 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 are things that are happening right now that I think are are moving the needle forward. So things, for instance, uh, like a, a lot of funding agencies now ask you to think about how is your work contributing to environmental justice? And, you know, you, of course, see some frustrating examples of uh, folks sort of sprinkling environmental justice. It's like when the National Science Foundation asks people, well, what are your broader impacts? The bar can be very, very low, uh, but... Uh, and the same can, can be said about environmental justice. But, you know, I find a lot of inspiration in, in, some, in, in some trends that are, I think, growing across various fields where we're now really thinking in more interdisciplinary terms and we're really thinking more in systemic terms. We're thinking more in terms of grounding our work in principles of justice and thinking what 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 the, what does that mean and having that type of awareness so i'm seeing it across various funding agencies 
Um, so I'm really hoping that this is part of a broader trend that ends up empowering uh, communities in the research process, as well as, you know, recognizing them as coalition partners, not just uh, recipients of information, recognizing them as knowledge producers. And I think that the, the, the field of decolonial uh, studies has been very advanced in, in that regard because they've been thinking a lot about, you know, movement generated theory, really acknowledging that there is power in knowledge production processes at the grassroots, uh, breaking with the uh, dominant notions that power, that, that knowledge can only be produced in our traditional centers of power uh, of of knowledge production. Uh, so, I, you know, insofar as those ideas, I think, start to diffuse. Um, and of course, they can be co-opted. But in, in a less cynical uh, approach, if, if these ideas continue to diffuse and, and, and shape disciplinary practices and, and processes, we might be we might be at a really important uh, turning point with respect to the role that higher education institutions, research institutions, um, even folks in, in media can play in, in, uh, within broader efforts for social change. Yeah, fantastic. I want to go back a bit to why I was kind of like, you know, saying where I think that this work of understanding resilient networks and mutual aid and political change is some of the most important work being done on earth right now. And that's because, you know, I, 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 we started to get into this a little bit, but I want to dive in deeper now. You know, I said Puerto Rico, like so many colonized areas, least responsible for climate change and ecological collapse, most vulnerable. And where in, we're seeing in the head of that is Puerto Rico has, doesn't have to look to the present or the future to understand what eco ecological collapse means, what system failures mean, that it's been experienced for so long. Now we're starting to see the climate collapse and the ecological collapse more largely is hitting everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But this is, this is decades and decades and centuries, really, if you want to think about it, but in terms of the contemporary context of genuine global ecological collapse, decades of, of this experience already unfolding in terms of extreme weather events, in terms of access to clean water, in terms of access to energy and food systems and all of these things, and the government simply failing to be there. And now we're starting to see that in Phoenix, 40 days over 110 degrees in one summer, people uh, just starting to die in mass. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing that with the wildfire smokes that is, is poisoning we're seeing that, you know, um, with with uh, extreme weather and fires and on and on and on and on, literally all over the world, we're seeing people jumping into oceans to avoid burning to death. And now in Libya, you know, again, the vulnerability of the least responsible, you know, entire neighborhoods and towns wiped off the map through a combination of 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 of, of the the effects of colonization and and, and lack of resilient infrastructure and extreme weather events so but this is becoming much more generalized mm -hmm. and i think we are now where these areas to learn is we are now going to be seeing by nature more and more failures of basic systems affecting much larger swaths of the population including in the centers of wealth where it had been been somewhat insulated and protected from and so this idea of how is it that when because it's not if it's already happening when systems fail. You know, it's not just Katrina, right? We're now looking at across the board. We're looking at insurers refusing to insure homeowners in large parts of California and, and, and Florida, and, and that's just going to extend. When systems fail to meet our basic needs, including in places where people have been insulated from that and felt confident when it's too expensive to get food at the grocery store, which people started to get a sense of people who had not had to experience that. This idea of, of mutual aid and resilient networks becomes critical 
-hmm. And this idea of how it combines, because I think it becomes critical for survival. It becomes critical because the kinds of systems that we need need to be locally rooted and based on what's the water flow. Are you drought prone, flood prone, or both prone? Are you, you know, what's the ability for people to grow food in this context? What's the energy production? What are the, re all of these things becomes about survival in a world that's quickly becoming catastrophic you know, catastrophize globally, but also then about how do we create the political movements to do that? So I think that's like, that's where I think everybody needs to be paying attention to this because guess what? There is no safe spot, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever privilege you think you cocooned, you live in, there is no safe spot. So we all mm -hmm. have to learn this lesson, right? This is something that Absolutely. we all have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, these, these networks, they, they often form organically, and I think they often form in unlikely places. Like, I think we, we tend to hold these negative views of humanity, and it, it makes us assume that, you know, when disasters strike, people are just going to look after themselves and things of that nature. And we all often forget that, you know, there's been instances where empathy and solidarity have been really the more remarkable uh, practices and, and values. So we have to think about how do we continue to build that type of solidarity? How do we build it in forms that are not limited to those who are citizens, for instance, or in ways that are not limited for, for, within national borders. I mean, you think, for instance, the kinds of struggles that uh, Libya and Morocco are now experiencing and that others in places like Bangladesh or in many other places that are exposed to uh, tropical cyclones, you know, we realize that international solidarity and coordination, they're, they're crucial. They're absolutely crucial for survival. Um, so we have to really think about how can folks in in the U.S. and in other countries of the global north commit themselves to solidarity well beyond their national borders, but also uh, within their national borders among those who may not be uh, considered to be citizens, right? So I think it's, it's crucial. Think, for instance, about a place like uh, New Orleans, where you have folks – who are really in, in supplying the workforce in really meaningful and important ways, but nevertheless being completely neglected when it comes to the types of needs that they might have. Even in those settings, we're, we're witnessing groups that organize themselves, that manage to find resources where a lot of folks assume that resources don't exist. So I think that there are lessons that can be drawn from that and to start supporting the development of broader solidarity and mutual aid networks while also making political demands that bring about broader uh, a policy change. Think, for instance, about flood insurance. If insurance companies no longer wish to profit off of communities because they don't think it's, no, it, it's, it's, it's profitable to insure people against uh, disasters, that this is an area where we must collectively as a society and as a state, step in and fill that void. Maybe, just maybe, the management of disasters should not be something that is for profit. It should, that should not, perhaps that shouldn't be the guiding value and interest in disaster management. So let's think, for instance, about how oftentimes there's been a neoliberal logic to disaster management in the United States. Uh, look at, for instance, with the cor coronavirus pandemic, many times w folks were, were left alone. They were said, figure out your own masks. Uh, folks were said, you're not el eligible for vaccines. We're not supplying the world with vaccines. Well, it turns out we shot ourselves on the foot because the virus doesn't respect national borders. So, uh, we see the we see that the responsibility for survival is allocated at the individual level 
uh, which is to the detriment of collectives. And, and instead, I think mutual aid provides an alternative approach to these neoliberal logics of disaster management, uh, where communities are much more involved and empowered in the process of securing uh, their lives, as well as uh, the resources that they need to survive. And, and to that end, there's been an increased uptake by private equity of disaster recovery firms. And there's a great piece in The Guardian um, on this, you know, that many of these funds, first of all, the way that they, you know, private, you know, vulture capital, as we say, profits is they go in, they take over an industry and they figure out how to screw the workers more to extract more value. Many of these workers are exactly, as you say, often undocumented workers, um, certainly the most vulnerable workers. And we're seeing an incredible increase in the level of safety violation of wage theft. So they're going in and many of these private equity firms are continuing to invest in fossil fuels. So they're actually quite legitimately part of the problem, part of the global catastrophic problem. And they are coming in, picking up these firms, hyper exploiting workers even more than they were, putting them in danger while continuing to feed that. And that that to me just seems that just sums up everything that's broken about the model of, you know, capitalism and colonization that has become the dominant system. It's just it's absurd by any. So you create the natural disaster or you add to it. You are part of the problem. Then you benefit by clearly underserving the people who are supposed to be getting the recovery and hyper exploiting, endangering the people doing the work. And this is to what end? And that, you know, so when we look at this idea that people can start to build up our own networks, counter to that, again, of interest to everyone, unless you are a horrible private equity person who is just looking to extract value off the bodies mm -hmm. of everyone around there. Like it's, it's that's that. And that is how the, then, then who is the government contracting? Well, they're contracting these groups owned by private equity. So like the, the urgency of building these kind of resilient networks, knowing that these disasters are gonna be coming faster and heavier in every corner of the globe becomes really one of survival. I mean, that it really is one of survival and not just for what we think of as the most vulnerable communities. Like that's all, what people gotta while, get their eye on. All the while also pushing for specific policies that mandate that we prioritize marginalized groups, the most vulnerable in disaster resource allocations. So, for instance, when power goes out, we consider corporations as important as communities uh, in terms of restoring energy. Well, as or more. <laughs> well, in, in how does it make sense that you have folks who are relying on electricity dependent equipment considered as important as a corporation that has no contribution to sustaining life? Yeah. Right. It, it, they can wait a few more days because what's at stake is a person's life. Right. And I think that we, those are the lives that are lost that are often not counted and that are not acknowledged. And there, these are not impossible policies to adopt. There are models out there. Um, I think this is where we need to combine the grassroots mutual aid type of effort that gives a face to the struggles that are faced by communities with the advocacy type uh, work that already pushes for specific policy proposals that would mandate that those communities are prioritized in the allocation of resources for disaster recovery and disaster management, but also in preparation, because when it comes to inequalities with respect to how people experience climate change, it's not only inequalities are only experienced in the wake of the disaster. They begin prior to them. Right. So how we invest in transmission lines, grid hardening efforts, things like uh, putting flood barriers around our critical infrastructure, where we build hospitals, which are priorities for energy restoration. All these things happen prior to yeah. a disaster and are often left unquestioned. Look at, for instance, the recent uh, budget coming out of the state of Florida, a state that is uh, exposed to uh, recurrent disasters. 
some of the veto line item vetoes were specifically flood mitigation uh, uh, projects in majority minority regions of Florida. And it's a concerted effort to expose those communities to broader risk in favor of playing politics with disaster resources. Yeah. This is identifiable. It's something that we can research. It's something that we can pinpoint and say this is playing politics with disaster resources. And it's something that we can draft policy to uh, to avoid. Yeah, yeah. And and I think I really want to just pull out a thread that you were talking about, which is in practice, prioritizing relief and recovery to the most vulnerable populations benefits the entire society. It's some. Of, it's the most effective money you can spend. Absolutely. And that's and that's one of the that's the you know that's one of the big lies that we've been taught, which is you know that at its crudest level where the populists are uh, very good at saying you know well the reason you don't have money is it's it's the immigrants it's it's the homeless it's the i don't know how they've managed to pull trans folks into that somehow like, i don't know you know just anybody that we decide to hate that's why you don't have the resources and that has been so successful but in fact when you take care of the most vulnerable, everyone is safer. Mm. Everyone is safer. And if you've made the least vulnerable, the most vulnerable safer, that means that your overall safety and your overall security has inherently raised. But a lot of it's very practical that, you know, we look at, uh, I mean, and, and, and COVID is definitely a great example of this, that when large groups of vulnerable people are left underserved, then this is, is a disease that doesn't go away for anyone and it puts everyone at danger. And I Absolutely. think you look across these things that we need to flip that, that actually taking care of the most vulnerable is an act of global self-preservation, not charity. Exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's redressing historical wrongs, which I think for you and I and probably most of the people we love should be enough. But it actually goes way beyond that, that by allowing the most vulnerable to continue to be victimized, we actually put all of our security at risk on, exactly. on so many levels. And one of the big things that that's going to come around global climate and ecological collapse is people don't understand that we are at the beginning of climate and ecological collapse induced mass migration. We're not in the thick of it. Mm -mm. We're just we're seeing just. And where those populations may be, may be places that people would never expect it. It's not just coming from Africa into Europe. It's parts of Europe that are, we're already seeing on the verge of unlivable parts of the United States, Canada, with these recurring fires. So people who sit in, again, that illusion of privilege, the privilege is real, but for most of the people who think they're inside the bubble, they're really not. They kind of are the membrane of the bubble, right? Mm -hmm. The really privileged sit inside and they use this layer of people who think that they're white skin or their 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 suburban American home or whatever it is. That's an illusion of, of of privilege in the end, because they will also be sacrificed as soon as these and, and some of these we're gonna be seeing mass migration for places that we don't expect it. And I think that that's like that kind of understanding, understanding that solidarity is actually the highest form of self-preservation, if you will. Um, and that's, that's something that, you know, certainly in the United States is our entire history since colonizing and stealing this land has been to crush that idea, right? Mm -hmm. Physically crushing the, the indigenous peoples and all of the, you know, I mean, obviously there's a huge variety of cultures that existed there, but the idea of mutual aid and all these things we're talking about, were much more embedded in those cultures. And so we've had 500 years of trying to crush that idea out of everybody's head and punish with incredible ferocity any marginalized group that starts to challenge it. And every marginalized group, when they do it, actually tends to be standing up for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's why they have to be crushed is not because they're only taking care of themselves. They're threatening the edifice of the idea of, 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 of that self-preservation is about harming others and, and understanding the solidarity. So I think that this is just, you know, it's a global, it's a global 
everything we're talking about is global and the learnings and where we find leadership, you know, is just so how do we flip this on the head? How do we flip this on the head? How do we get people to understand this and, and understand that their solidarity today is about their and their family and their loved ones survival tomorrow? And I really do think, I mean, I think it's, I don't think it's an exaggeration. I don't think it's hyperbole. I think that you look at the craziness in the world and there is no safe spot. There is no safe spot. No, not for long. And of course, these are places where folks often don't see that it's it's going to come. Yeah. Uh, so I think the challenge for us is to think about how do we raise the perception of urgency in places where folks uh, are, are thinking that's 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 really far out or it's it's just not going to affect us. Yeah. Right. That's, that's something that we need to uh, just give a lot more attention to. And, and one project that I'm hoping I would love to, I think we talked about this uh, when we first, when we first spoke that I would love to collaborate with you on that, that uh, undeniable and the our kind of parent 501c3, the climate science education project, a long-term project that we're hoping to um, facilitate, find others to work with, spark, bring resources to, um, because it's not a one group kind of project, is building out a knowledge base of how these things are done. Um, everything from the political challenges of working across grassroots organizing and 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 political organizing and mutual aid to the practicalities of creating local energy grids that are resilient mm -hmm. and independent um and 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 the regulatory stuff that comes up as that as 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 vested power tries to undermine it to what is it like to create urban farms on parkland there's uh you know uh in new york it's called green thumb they've got there are farms that are that are that are that are built on on city park land. How did that come about? To how do you deal with rats in farms in an urban area? To the practicalities, you know, I really feel like there's a, a knowledge base, and that so much of this is when we it kind of goes back to the beginning of that knowledge, you know, flowing upwards from the grassroots. That this knowledge production and from indigenous technologies and methodologies. You know, that there's so much knowledge that's critical to our ability to survive the coming decades, you know, which are going to be wild. Um, and that's something that we want to be part of. And, and, and like, how do we start to document this in a way that people can have that as a resource and start learning and sharing and building best practices? Um, and so that's something I hope we can collaborate on is, Absolutely. is, is making films and and curricula and, 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 and generalizing this. And I don't know all the structures we're starting to make our pieces. We're working actually the USC, we've been talking with them, the USC climate justice center. Um, nice. I don't know if you know them, but they've got some great principles on their work and they're just starting to build these, this network. Cause it's not going to be one group. Like I said, it's like, how do we all start to build this up? It's almost like, I don't know if you're a science fiction fan, but the <laughs> Isaac Asimov's foundation is now a TV series, but it was, you know, the idea that you could, build the knowledge to shorten the darkness that was coming. In that case, I think it was 10,000 years to a thousand years. I feel like that's the place we're in as humanity, which is many have never left the darkness since the dawn of colonization and slavery and all that. Many have been and left in that. But in general, as a species and the many species that we are intertwined with, we are entering into a very dark period. But what we do now every day of action and every day of transformation now has more impact on the future than ever could have been possible before so how is it that we build up these knowledge sharing these ideas of where of inverting our sense of where leadership and knowledge production comes from um and 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 start to build these things up i'm i'm hoping outside of this conversation that we and i I, I'll bring it to you, like I said, that we try and do in practices, although our resources are small, I'm trying to end them, which is how can we be of service? Yeah. The projects that you're working on, how can we be of service to help you memorialize, document, generalize, translate, and hopefully start finding resources, even in the storytelling, 
to go down to the grassroots, to go down to there, just to all of these things. So that's, that's something I'm really looking forward to us and hopefully working on in the future together. And this is this is crucial work. And, you know, one, one thing that I've, I've been involved in is in trying to change a number of things within the higher education setting, one of which is a breaking with the traditional uh, model of dissemination of information, which essentially is, you know, you have some findings, you publish them in some uh, paywalled, peer reviewed article, and that's where it goes to die. <laughs> except for a handful of your colleagues that might be interested in it. So we need to really take responsibility in, in the higher education setting um, for breaking with that model and acknowledging that if we as a society are going to invest in research, then we need the research to reinvest in society. And the current model is not in service of the society that is sustaining the research so there are many ways of doing that, and I think the work that you're doing is a crucial uh, piece of that puzzle of how we do that, but also relationships, right? So there is no better way to disseminate information and, and, and findings than to have genuine relationships with those who would benefit from that uh, information. So that requires stepping out of our uh, comfort within the confines of academic institutions, and I think that there are excellent, excellent insights on how to go about doing that. So disseminating information and diffusing practices of information dissemination would, would be crucial to achieve that. The other thing that I think we need to take responsibility for within higher education settings is that we think that because we do work around questions of justice and the environment, that we've had a sufficient contribution to uh, questions of the environment and justice. Well, it turns out that our, our, we hold certain privileges and power that we could allocate to broader collective efforts and that there needs to be political work done well beyond higher education. It is not enough to choose to study questions of justice. It is as important to be involved in organized efforts to achieve justice. So to that end, we need to consider joining collective efforts among scholars, things like, you know, Scholars for Social Justice. Uh, there are other networks that are involved. I've been involved in, in many of them. Uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. If you're, uh, if 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 that's where you find a home, there's uh, the Scholar Strategy Network. So there are a number of organized efforts out there that are there to support mobilizing scientists and scholars. Uh, so people really they have vehicles for organizing, uh, and it, it needs to be part of the work that we do. We can't just gain. Uh, 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 enough satisfaction from uh, the latest publication that will never be read beyond your networks. <laughs> yeah. And how much more satisfying to actually have that research cycle be a circle of, of, of trans and translating resources, you know, and I think it's, I think it's interesting because I think like how um, the, fossil fuel divestment movement has grown up and seen some successes. I think NYU just actually um, um, has, has I, don't, I haven't been able to dig into the details to I see what, what, too, yeah. what, lo what loopholes may exist. Cause <laughs> one imagines when it comes to billions of dollars and one of the biggest right. landlords in the city, they will be <laughs> fighting for loopholes, but still a huge victory. But that actually what we're talking about is a whole other front on that, which is, you know, because institutions like NYU have massive financial resources, massive uh, human resources, knowledge bases, technical bases, how can that flow of resources also itself be, be transformed? Absolutely. How do we not just do it, as you said, in a publication that talks about the importance of decolonizing academia by writing papers about decolonization? Um, which, again, papers, that's, I, I, it's not, I, I, I don't think like you either, it's not that writing of papers and research is not to turn up your noses, but in isolation, it is inherently in isolation, right? That's mm -hmm. the problem is when that is in isolation, when it becomes part of this flow of information, knowledge, wealth, 
resources, expertise, that that's when suddenly academia can become transformative rather than merely, you know, um, there's a perfect word there that my brain's just not going to find. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, existing for the purpose of re re reproducing the same logics of turning out students as if we were diploma factories, you know, and yeah. I think people don't like that. I mean, I know for a fact that colleagues yeah. don't like that to, to be perceived as service providers, yeah. uh, but they often align with the broader logics of providing services. So I think that we are seeing battles that we can wage within the higher education setting, but we also have to stress uh, the importance of becoming involved in those struggles well beyond it. So we're seeing, for instance, we're reforming tenure and promotion guidelines in various institutions. I think that it was the um, American Anthropological Association issued a, a wonderful guide on how academic departments can change their tenure and promotion guidelines to uh, allocate more value to community engagement efforts. And I've now been involved in more than one department that has taken these very seriously and has sought to reform these um, these guidelines for tenure and promotion. And we've been talking about this. We've been talking about changing the incentive structures uh, so that we value this work as much as we value the traditional forms of dissemination. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You've been so generous with your time, especially because this is our second go at this. Um, so I, I want to be aware of your time, but is, is there anything else that you'd like to touch on um, in the conversation? I'm pretty certain unless you refuse to speak to me that this will not be our last conversation. No, <laughs> Just, I, I would I'm love so to excited by the things conversation. We, we've dug up, but is there anything uh, on, on what we've done that you'd like to sum up with? Um, Just also appreciation for, for the work that you're all doing. You know, we're, we're really at a moment where we're witnessing opportunities. I think that uh, 2020 was uh, an important moment and in our history and it it really opened up some important pathways for changing the current composition of science scientific institutions academic institutions institutions of higher education with that we're seeing new generations of scholars coming in with a different set of commitments that have been politicized differently that have witnessed uh, instances and experienced instances of uh, violence, uh, police violence, racist violence, and other types of, of events that have really shaped how they see the world. So uh, this is a, a moment that we can seize. Uh, there are opportunities right now that we can seize to, to build stronger struggles and long-term struggles to defend our current victories, but also to strive for more and to have a more systemic understanding of, of social change. So I really appreciate you uh, making this space uh, for this conversation. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing where, where this work uh, keeps moving forward to. And, and I'm, I'm excited to uh, bring more colleagues into, into this type of work uh, and to support the work that you're doing. Fantastic. Fernando, thank you for the work you're doing. I'll say it again. I think it's some of the most important work on the planet. And, and I hope that we can, in fact, work to amplify that work and continue to work together. So thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you.